it's been, and the West, specifically America, has been doing this for years. I mean, you know, we're the big heroes of World War II, but it's like, you know, we had segregated military units. <laughs> I mean, we put Japanese in internment camps, you know, which was mainly a land grab to just take Japanese Americans who were American citizens to take their property and their businesses and their land and put them in. And we still don't want to really talk about that in America. And it's, it's just, it's preposterous. We can't, you know, we don't want to fa Americans, uh, I'll be very, Americans do not want to know how the sausage is made. They just, they don't want it. Everything, they just want everything nice and clean and they want the, they don't want to know where the, where it comes from. They don't want to know the animal was murdered. They don't want to know their pretty little diamond rings come from slave labor in Africa. They don't want to know that. They don't want to know that this country was founded on genocide and slavery. They don't want to know that. And I think if Americans were to confront all of those realities, then maybe it, America could become the idea. The, the, the idea of America is perfect, in my opinion. The Bill of Rights and the- Oh my God, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but what do they tell you? Like what's step one of AA, isn't it? Like accept that you're an addict? Step one is admit that you're powerless over alcohol. So- you, uh, Is that not exactly what we're talking about? That yep. you, have, you have to sur surrender to the admission of the reality of your situation before you can do anything to change it? That, that's such a great analogy. We've And I've talked about this with Jimmy and other people. It, it is, America is like a bunch of addicts or the adult children of an alcoholic. Like if you grow up in an alcoholic household, the parents that are abusive alcoholics tell you that this is your reality and that this is normal. They basically tell you the sky is green. And then when you finally wake up at some point and go, wait a minute, the sky's blue. They go, you're nuts. Oh, a little blue sky crazy one over here. And... Um, that's where America is right now. America is in like an alcoholic home. The, the parents are alcoholics and abusive people and the, fam the whole family is living in denial about all the alcohol and the trauma and the abuse. <laughs> That's what it is. And they think it's like the family on the outside and everyone think, oh, that family's so nice and neat. They got this nice home and nice Christmas photos and inside the family there's abuse and physical and sexual abuse and, and all this stuff and corruption and greed and they're, you know, they're in debt up to their eye. And from the outside, the nice home, the nice cars, the nice kids with the college degrees and that's what America is. We don't realize, you know, like everyone's screaming about you know, oh, we, get, we gotta go down to Venezuela. There's people eating out of garbage cans in Venezuela. There's people eating out of garbage cans in every oh, major- eventually, I've seen them. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, every major city in America. There's a tent city. There's Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles next to these massive skyscrapers and the Staples Center and LA Live and all. It's unbelievable. You know, and they're, Maduro's, you know, gassing his own people. Well, we do that. We shoot tear gas at people. We shot tear gas and water cannons at people that just wanted um, clean, drinkable water on their sovereign land <laughs> at the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, at, the, at Standing Rock. So it's like America doesn't want to confront it. it. They don't, they don't, it's such a great analogy that you made. They don't want to confront that, that they have a problem. <laughs> Yeah, and I think America gets a lot of flack unnecessarily because I think that it's um it's imperialism. I think the the imperial conquest project never ended, and I think that from what we know from studying intelligence files, um, intelligence agencies documents, they have a hundred partner countries now that are all in their global network, their global network. Um, and I think that it's so easy for us to say America, 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 but if we're honest about it. New Zealanders is culpable. New Zealand military is committing war crimes in Afghanistan. Has been proven to be by Nikki Haga and John Stevenson, um, two New Zealand journalists. Um, Australia is totally culpable. Um, all those big satellites at Pine Gap are signals for drone strikes. Uh, Germany is totally culpable. I mean, I'm just picking out three of a hundred examples. Oh, the UK. But what it really is now, it's a, it's a global elite with a global network of oppression and control. And I think we have a large amount of American media shoved down the world's throats. And so we tend to identify Americans as being like the problem, but it's not actually Americans that are the problem. It is the 1% and 
against the 99%. That is it. I tell people there's not two parties in America. There's two classes and these classes run the, the planet. There's the, there's the ruling class. And I start talking in those terms, the ruling class has bought up everybody. And that's the thing. And the, the, the war machine is a part of the ruling class. So like you look at the height of global defense spending, not just the United States, but all the, all the countries in the world was in the early 80s during the height of the Cold War. So we, they're, they're, that's why they're pushing for this again, because if Russia's the big, scary, bad guy, then guess what? Australia's got to buy weapons. Germany, the UK, all those hundred countries that you just mentioned all have to buy weapons. And then guess what? All of Russia's allies have to buy weapons. And then, yay, the defense contractors are, are making even more profits while, you know, half of the planet is in turmoil. I mean, that, that statistic, that's something like, what is it, like 44 billionaires have as much wealth as half of the, the world? Like, they could give up half of their money. It wouldn't, they wouldn't be affected at all. They wouldn't lose a vacation home or a private jet. And three and a half billion people's lives would all improve. You are a goddamn sociopath if you know you could help that many people and don't do anything about it and then further their oppression just so you can get another private island. The thing though is that that billionaires club self-polices. So you don't get to be one of those billionaires um, just on your own merit. The meritocracy is a myth. The idea that if you just work hard and you just have a good idea, you'll become a billionaire. No, that's not how it works. Uh, long before you become a billionaire, you are vetted and either accepted or rejected by the millionaires and billionaires club and the um, social environment that they are in. It's a very incestuous environment. And if you look like you are going to step out of the bounds of what is acceptable in that environment, you will be, <laughs> not good things will happen to you. Let's put it that way. In many ways, those 44 people are figureheads, like the media figureheads, like the political figureheads. Mm -hmm. um, they are figureheads that are put forward but in fact, it is the system that they serve that controls them just as it controls us. And in many ways, those billionaires are enslaved and live in the same types of cages as, as we do. Um, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are the first publishing organization to truly give the raw truth of the inside mechanics of the system, the the uh, institutions th that um, maintain that system of control mm -hmm. to the public. It's the first time in human history that we've had access to that much information about what's really going on. And if we want to hold on to that ability to access and receive that type of information about the system that rules us, then we have got to do what people are doing this week and come together en masse and protect Julian and protect WikiLeaks and thereby protect our own right. Because just as we talked about the first step of um, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that information is, is gifting yourself that knowledge um, and being able to accept it is the first step to doing something about it. Yeah, it's a great point because, man, that's such a great, giving people historical reference. I think that's part of it too. When they control the narrative, they can change the history or, or uh, uh, not talk about things. And what you just made a great point. This last 20 years of 20, 30 years maybe of the internet and everybody having access digitally, for centuries, the ruling class has been able to keep all of their evil doings fairly hidden and control the narrative. And we had journalism was, you know, modern journalism was, there was good investigative reporting who they were, they, journalists used to be the watchdogs of those in power and now they're the guard dogs. And that's why they're so terrified. They have to control this narrative because for the first time, they've kind of set up their own demise because they want to have access to everything. They want to hack into this stream and your phone and my laptop and know what all of us are doing. So then that means they're keeping digital files of everything, which means then someone along the way goes, 
Someone with a heart and a soul goes, this isn't right. Somebody at the NSA watching this right now could go, you know what? This ain't right. I'm going to push, I'm going to leak this stuff. And that's what terrifies them. It's, it's refusing to consent um, and refusing to comply, uh, which is what we've been discussing earlier is what Chelsea Manning has done with the grand jury proceedings against WikiLeaks. She has said, I have a choice. You, uh, you cannot just intimidate me. You cannot just threaten me. You cannot just pressure me. I have a choice and I choose not to comply. I choose not to consent. And that's incredibly powerful. And when somebody does- You choose not to consent every time you make your own show instead of watching someone else's, you know, instead of, instead of watching Rachel Maddow because then you'll get awesome jobs in Hollywood um, and be an ex acceptable comedian. Yeah. Um, you're refusing to comply and you're refusing to consent um, when you tell the truth. You've chosen a path of, a path of truth, Graham. I've, I've watched you. I've watched you do it. You've chosen a path of truth. It's not an easy path, but it's the right one. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I was- uh, in I think June of 2017, I'd been doing political vigilante, uh, for about six months and I was hired by a big movie review company, um, to do a movie review game show. Cause I also have a movie review podcast called comedy film nerds. I've, I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I'm, we've written a book and they, and I've hosted game shows and I was, I was just picked. I met the guy at the Hollywood improv and he just gave me a job and we were, formulating this show and they fired me for my Twitter feed. And my Twitter feed was not like swearing all caps or anything. And it wasn't going after Trump either. I was going after corporate Democrats in the California state assembly that had just Anthony Rendon specifically, who had just shot down single payer healthcare. They're trying to get free healthcare for every uh, citizen of the state of California, which they could easily do. California has the fifth largest economy in the world. Right. And Democrats who are paid by the healthcare lobby and big pharmaceuticals undercut it. And that was what my Twitter feed was just calling them out. And I lost my job for that. And I remember having to sit there and I had to make a decision. I was only six months into doing political vigilante and I had to go, man. And I felt that fear because I've done over 300 episodes of television. There's some, if you want to watch me in, in bad bowling shirts and long sideburns and too much makeup, you can see me hosting this game show strip poker. <laughs> um, but I had to make that decision because I know how Hollywood works. And I was like, I either need to stop doing this, stop putting this out there if I want to get hired by them. And I went, no, it's not right. It's not right. What they're doing to me is not right. So instead, um, I made a video and my girlfriend at the time goes, you should just tell, tell the story then tell it, put it out there. And I told, and I said, this is what happened. I didn't name any names or the network, whatever, but it's a, it's an online company that's owned by one of the five major multinational conglomerates that control everything. And when they control the war narrative, they also control who gets to be in this funny sitcom and that funny movie and this action thing and who gets to play this superhero, all that stuff. So, and I said, you know what? I ain't changing shit. And I made that decision then. I was six months into doing it. And I said, that's it. I don't care. And I saw them start to demonetize videos and all the censorship that they're doing. And I just said, I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it. And then I started meeting people like you and I started watching Lee Camp and I was reading Chris Hedges and I was like, well, then this is the team I'm, out, I'm down with. These people are like, it's that guy that stood in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square. I'm on that guy's side. I'm on Rosa Parks' side. That's the, that's the side I'm on. You want to come at me? Bring it. We're all going to die. I've studied samurai. So I'll just, I just yeah, spot on death. You're spot on. And you know what? Those people, what they were doing was essentially bullying you, bullying you and forcing you to try, wanting you to comply. And if you give in to a bully, it never stops there. Uh -uh. You know, first they want your Twitter feed and they want you to watch what you say in public. Then what do they want you to do? Then what do they want you to do? Yeah. You'll always have to comp, you'll always have to compromise yourself and compromise yourself and compromise yourself to make yourself acceptable to people who you don't want to be like anyway. Yeah. And you end up you end up imaging yourself in their image, or you choose the Julian Assange path and you put up the middle finger and you say, "No, I'm going to do what's right." Uh, to hell with the, you know. 
to hell with the consequences, going to do what's right and hope that enough people do what's right with you. So I totally respect that you made that right decision there. Thanks. And I, I have, so I sleep well at night. I see comics that are getting Netflix specials and they're funny comedians and they're, they're writing good jokes, but it's always this comedy of apathy. Oh, I'm all out of shape and I'm a slacker and I'm a this, that, and the other thing because they, maybe they can make a Trump joke. They can make fun of his hair or something like that, but they can't sit there and say Obama dropped 26,171 bombs in 2016 alone. His tweets were polite. That's the difference. <laughs> you know, they can't make those jokes because then the, the, the coloring, they're coloring in the lines. Yeah. They're coloring inside the lines and, and they live in fear of going outside them and they live in fear of losing what little they've managed to gather for themselves by compromising their integrity and by compromising themselves. And they are the ones who are full of regrets on their deathbed. That's what it comes down to. They're the ones always wondering, what if, what if I'd made the other choice? What if I'd gone the other way? Mm -hmm. You know, you'll never wonder that about compromising yourself. You'll never think, oh, what if I had compromised myself and like my integrity? Like, you'll never feel that way. I promise you. Hey, I'm really sorry, but we're getting kicked out of here now because Vivian Kubrick and Matthew Ho are here and waiting for their spot. Hello, but it Vivian was great to Matthew. see you. I'll chuck, I'll add them to the stream. We can say hi really quickly before they go. Because I don't have corporate masters to fire me if I do something <laughs> down off that. I'm not going to get in trouble in the debrief. <laughs> hi, Matthew. I wanted to say hi to you, so hello. Hi, Susie. I've been hey, listening. Hi. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's been brilliant. I, ever since I popped out of bed, I've been listening. Um, and also... Uh, I listened to your interview. Oh, by the way, hello. Hi. <laughs> Graham. <laughs> so, Graham, thank you. Right, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that was brilliant. Oh, I love the picture behind you. That's very high tech. I'm, I'm strictly on my couch with my dog. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, what, I don't know, Graham, if you've had the chance to listen to the Winnie, uh, Winnie, William Binney. Um, interview that Susie did, oh, but it was yes, it was awesome. It was so awesome. And um, you know, he's, I, my I mean, favorite, he's one of my favorite people to interview. I actually said to our tech guys before the interview started, I said, "Oh, sweet, William Benny's next. I get to just kick the shit out of the intelligence agencies for an <laughs> hour." <laughs> I, was like, yeah. I love I well, love doing that. <laughs> yeah, and I am really looking forward to hearing you go through the Edward Snowden papers with him. That is going to be. Oh, I know. Absolutely. That's going to be cool too. Yeah, we're going to do a new oh, series of the stuff for you. My, I, I mean, awesome. you're you're a two-man, uh, you know, Secret Service analysis team. It's like, <laughs> you it's know, like I said to him, I'm like, what what a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to go through the NSA's own leaked documents with the ex NSA <laughs> team <technical> director. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's it's almost poetically, pristinely, beautifully, uh, just uh, as in justice. Comment. Yeah, really, really. And, and okay, and I'm going to get off your stream. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, right. I'm going to get off your stream because I'm. I have okay. other little little people needing my time now. Absolutely. Graham, I love seeing you. Matthew, nice to meet. Kind of meet you. Have a yeah. great time with. Me. And goodbye to everybody who's been watching and supporting. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. Bye bye. bye, -bye. See you soon. See you in September. Bye, Susie. Have a great rest of your stream, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Greg.